Coming up this morning, Nigeria gets into a pivotal point with a surge in political campaigns. These in the midst of increase in debt, inflation and discontent across the country. We'll be talking the state of the nation with Sat Guru Maharaji this morning. And support for former governor of Lagos State grows, including from a media owner, Raymond Dokpesi, a member of the opposition PDP. And in a twist, a court orders Dokpesi to be taken off EFCC's watch list hours after publicly endorsing Tinubu. And also coming up this morning is Off the Press, where we review the major stories of today's newspapers. say glad to have you join us on the breakfast here on plus tv africa this very very interesting tuesday morning here uh, in lagos and of course uh, for those in the southeast it's obviously the first day that you will be going to work because of the seat at home on mondays but welcome to the breakfast i am osaogi ogbonwa as always, we start with top trending stories, and we have two very interesting stories for you this morning. First of all, of course, it's starting with uh, one that I just mentioned, and that is the founder and owner of uh, Da Communications, Raymond Dogpesi. It's a name that has been known for a very, very long time, for probably since the 80s or even earlier, um, with the you know foundation of Da Communications. Of course, uh, here in Lagos, we, uh, well, across the country, everyone knows of uh, AIT. Um, but of course, aside, you know, his interest in media and television, um, he also, of course, got involved with politics a couple of years ago. Um, if you remember in the 2015, after the elections in 2015, there was a lot of, you know, clamor and lots of conversations going on with regards to the fight against corruption. And one of the biggest stories then was the $2.1 billion that was allegedly embezzled by certain persons in the previous administration. Most importantly, Sambo uh, Dasuki, the... Um, and I say back then, um, of course, we all remember how that trial went and how that case went. He was in prison for a very, very long time. Oh, well, held by the security agencies for a very long time um, without, you know, any actual uh, court, you know, sentencing him to jail. Um, there was a lot of clamor for his release. And eventually the government eventually did set him free a few about two years ago, I believe. Um, but one of the persons who was also involved in that, you know, chaos and in that, you know, in those allegations is uh, Chief Raymond Dogpesi, who is, of course, the founder of Dark Communications. Um, he, of course, had his own, you know, time with the EFCC and with Nigeria security agencies. Um, the court case, you know, that has lasted for a very, very long time. I believe sometime in April... There was a court ruling uh, that um, by the court of appeal, basically, that seemingly set him free, um, and um, you know, asked that uh, case be thrown out because the EFCC couldn't really prove its case. Um, but yesterday, the chief uh, judge, uh, Chief Justice John Soho of the Federal High Court in Abuja held that Raymond Dogpesi had no criminal allegations, and the charges against him weren't you know, strong enough, or didn't hold any water. Um, he basically held that no criminal charges or allegations currently raised against uh, Raymond Dogpesi should stand. Um, if you remember also, he was the organizing committee chairman of the PDP's national conference in 2015. The Federal High Court yesterday ordered that the EFCC should go further and remove him from their watch list. Um, and so that's really what has created most of the controversy, uh, mostly because this is, you know, just almost immediately after he threw his support behind former Lagos State Governor Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who, you know, you know from uh, what uh, the media is saying, very likely would be running for president in 2023. Um, so uh, it, it really, from this is my perspective now, it really could just be coincidence. It could be timing, you know, and that's what makes it look fishy. Um, um, he has every right, of course, Bola Metinubu has every right, and we've said it m multiple times, to run for president. And at the same time, every person who, you know, is a Nigerian has every right to support who they choose to support. And that includes Raymond Dogpesi. Um, he says, of course, that he's supporting him because of their friendship, which has been on for a very long time. And, of course, if you have, if you know, of course, they, they are about the same age, I think both 69 or both 70. Um, and so, you know, there's really nothing surprising seeing that, you know, these two persons, you know, would be friends, you know, they've known each other, I believe, for a long time. And there's nothing really, really surprising about it. Um, what really has caught a lot of people's attention is the fact that this is happening, you know, almost seemingly back to back, you know, immediately throws the support. Um, the court then orders 
uh, the EFCC to, to take him off, you know, their watch list. Um, and that's what, you know, everyone is pointing out, you know, as seeming like, oh, you know, immediately you support a part of the government, you immediately, you know, get, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, taken off, you know, whatever um, allegations that were placed against you in the past. And um, so that's what people have made, uh, have pointed out to seem a little fishy. But I personally um, will want to look at this as, you know, seemingly coincidence. It might just be a thing with uh, timing and um you know, maybe that's why, you know, it's, it's creating some controversy. But another thing that I will point out with regards to this case is it seems like it's yet another um, occasion where the EFCC, and, you know, we, we can never really tell who exactly to blame here, but where the EFCC has once again, you know, failed to prove its case against some of the people that were very, very popular in the news. Um, while being accused of corruption or money laundering or misappropriation of funds when the government came to power in 2015. One of those names, once again, that, of course, you know, it seems like the EFCC has failed to fully prosecute. And it's one of the reasons that we've continued to say in Nigeria that we need to do better with our criminal justice system and mostly with the investigative aspect of it. Um, so we don't continue to have these allegations and these arrests and these hounding of persons, then eventually the court throws out these cases and you know, there's really nothing um, that EFCC can do at that point. Um, it, it makes it really, really seem like some of these things are really political instead of actual uh, money laundering charges. And they would, um, and maybe they only existed in the first place because they belong to the opposition political party in the country. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that, yeah, you know, that's exactly the case, but that's what it seems like. And it's it's one too many of these, you know, situations where people are arrested, you know, they, there's public, you know, um, and media trial, and there's so much talk about it. The EFCC, of course, goes left and right, trying to ensure that these persons, um, you know, are, are found guilty, you know, in the media, but fails to, you know, ensure that they're found guilty in court. Um, and it, it's happened too many times, and we've seen so many of these, uh, you know, situations. And not just that, there's also a couple of situations where we've seen in the last few years where persons who joined the All Progressive Congress or throw some support behind the All Progressive Congress or speak in their favor suddenly no longer have corruption cases against them. And these are persons that have had these cases for many, many years. Suddenly, you know, have those cases thrown out um, somehow, some way. It's just, you know, yet another example. And so, you know, it's a good time to look at these situations once again and say, who exactly is to blame here? Who exactly would we say maybe has gotten it wrong? Is it the EFCC and its prosecution? Is it the investigative part of it? You know, did they do their, you know, groundwork and their homework, you know, you know 100%? before his name was even called out to be a suspect in the money laundering charge um, back then in 2015? Or is it a criminal, is it the justice system, judicial system that once again has shown um, that it has some loopholes here and there that can be beaten, um, you know, no matter what the crime or the charge against you is? Um, these are, you know, for me, the biggest part of this whole conversation. Um, I'm, I'm going to move away from the part where it says, oh, you know, immediately he supports uh, Balame Tinubu, his case is thrown out. Because I, I don't think that should be the focus. Even if, yes, it looks, it does look fishy. You know, I want to assume and, put, you know, place the benefit of doubt and say, okay, maybe it's really just timing. Maybe he, the court was always going to do this regardless of whether he supported uh, Balame Tinubu or not. Um, but once again, what more needs to be done by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission? What more needs to be done by our judicial system to ensure that we don't continue to have these cases that really just look political instead of cases that are watertight and have actual facts uh, behind them before a person is arrested or is even named um, in a uh, corruption uh, case? Well, that's on that story, and we'll move away from there and move to the southeast. Well, this actually happened in Lagos, but it's for the uh, former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi. He also ran in 2019 as vice presidential candidate under the PDP, um, alongside uh, former vice president, Atiku Abubakar. He's been in the news lately, um, but not for the best reasons. Um, last week, if you remember, I spoke about this, that the uh, Premium Times newspapers did put out a report 
um, one of the, I think it was their second Pandora Papers report, the first one actually, Pandora Papers report, uh, st talking about money, you know, um, 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 shell accounts that have been opened, rather, in different countries around the world. The British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, many places across the world, Cyprus even, where, you know, rich people, wealthy pe people, politicians, kings and queens, businessmen, open these shell accounts where they somehow, you know, kept, uh, keep their money to avoid paying taxes in whichever country. But one of the challenges with it is the fact that there's a lot of people who run criminal gangs and use these shell accounts to hide money that has been either stolen or been gotten through drug peddling or money laundering. There is that. And that's what, of course, Peter Obi's name, you know, uh, came up with um, sometime last week. There was a lot of conversations about it, mostly um, about you know, whether he did declare to the Nigerian government that he had those shell accounts or not. Um, and then there were those who, you know, you know, maybe also mentioned that, well, the Premium Times report didn't necessarily say that these uh, funds were stolen. They really only said that he had a shell account in a different country where money was kept, you know, which isn't necessarily a crime, except it was not declared. But the biggest conversation really out of all of that was, you know, the source of wealth. And that what and that's um, what really has been, you know, a source of conversation in the last couple of days with some of the persons who are running for or likely to run for president in 2023. And his name has always um, repeatedly come up, mostly because there's a lot of people who have looked at him and said, this is one of Nigeria's purest and cleanest politicians. One of the people that you look at and say, okay, this one has a really, really clean record from the time that he was governor. And there's really nothing that you can you know, point at and say, okay, well, he is dirty here or is dirty in this other direction. Um, and so that's, you know, that conversation continued to build until yesterday when he got on, you know, a sister uh, a television station here in Lagos. And the question was asked about the source of his wealth. And of course, he went on to make, you know, very, very interesting statements and, share, and shared how he had been very, very wealthy even before he joined politics and how politics even made him poorer because he had to step away from his businesses that he was running. He was Nigeria's only or sole importer of, you know, certain items. Um, he mentioned Heinz uh, uh, products, um, you know, and then some wines and alcohol, basically FMCG um, uh, products. Um, he also, of course, is, you know, was a um, uh, board chairman of, you know, certain banks uh, for many more than 30 years. Um, and, of course, I also finally still mentioned that he still, still has major shares in, you know, about three major banks here in Nigeria. And those were some of the things that he had to mention yesterday, just to show that he really didn't make a lot of money from politics, or politics is really not the source of his wealth. Most of his wealth came from businesses that he had run before, uh, joining politics and before becoming governor. But I want to share some of the thoughts of um, certain persons who reacted to this, um, which, you know, I found pretty interesting. A guy here, Sadiq Tade, says, Peter Obi is so sure of his ways that he had to come openly on TV to explain his worth and the source of his money, even though he isn't in office. Also, remember how Shea Makinde declared his assets in 2019, a better way to explain transparency and accountability. I found that very interesting. And also, uh, Safin, his name is Ugo, also you know, put out the statement, said, Loki, it's annoying that he had to go to clear his name. Some people have, um, you know, heroine, kingpin histories, and <laughs> I'm probably going to skip that one. Well, I'll go ahead. He said, some people have heroine, kingpin histories, and drove bullion vans into their houses, but have become, you know, the next messiah. When you're from, he goes on to say, when you're from a certain section of the country, your kaftan has been white and stainless before. Your kaftan rather has to be white and stainless before anyone considers you being worthy of presidency. From other parts of the country, instead, you could be a repented shakao and you're good to go. I probably will share that again. It says, when you're from certain parts of the country, your kaftan has to be white and stainless before anyone considers you worthy of the presidency. From other parts, you could go and be, a, or rather, you could be a repented Abubakar Shekau, and you are still good to go. I'm sure you get the message in that um, um, uh, um, you know, post. And this one also here says, Peter Obi is a better person than Nisha because, well, I, I won't send Nigerians. The standards Nigerians expect from Peter Obi, not even Buhari, was uh, this um, scrutinized. Obi has to explain his wealth, his standards of governance to people that elected the current uh, president twice. It says here, the moment you treat Nigerians with respect, they see you as weak. And in quote, also says, GEJ was weak. And of course, referring to how he, uh, the former president was described later um, uh, 2014. 
Nigerians said th these things because their president allowed them to exercise the, uh, the rights or their rights to insult him. Um, I'm going to share one part again. It says here, Peter Obi is a better person than me because, well, I, I won't send Nigerians. The standards Nigerians expect from Peter Obi, not um, not even Buhari was this scrutinized. Obi asked to explain his wealth and his standards of governance to people that elected Buhari twice. Um, and that's from a guy called Sir William. Uh, these are just some of the reactions that I found pretty interesting, um, you know, with regards to uh, the video that, of course, uh, was posted yesterday of Peter Obi explaining the source of his wealth. And I kind of agree that, you know, there are certain persons across Nigeria's political space that really aren't held to any standards. They aren't, you know, scrutinized, they aren't questioned. There's a certain persons that we even know, and we're not talking about, you know, having to dig now. We know about a very dirty past that they have. We've heard, we've seen, we've, you know, heard, you know, of investigations. We've, you know, found them, you know, and they probably have been found guilty in, you know, different regards here and there. But they aren't even asked these questions. They aren't put on the same pedestal. They aren't made to, you know, you know to, to declare their wealth. They aren't made to answer certain questions, you know, when they want to vie for political office. But instead, when you see others, you know, from a certain part of the country, and unfortunately, that's what it seems, when you see others from another part of the country or from a different political party, the conversation is entirely different. The standards are different. The questions are different. The interrogation is completely different. Regardless of how clean this person's past seems to be, you see people still go ahead to dig as far as they can, dig until they find crude oil. Um, just to ensure that they, you know, paint them dirty and ensure that, you know, they find something that is, you know, that makes them not worthy. Why don't we have the same standards for every single person who um, wants to run for political office in Nigeria, regardless of where you come from, regardless of what part of the, or what tribe or what religion or what political party that you are in? Why don't we have the same standards and ask them to also have these same conversations? It would break my heart completely. If, and this happened in 2019, if you remember, just before the elections, there were certain things, and I've said, repeatedly said it, that the, the standards with which we interrogate people who seek political office in Nigeria are so poor. If you remember in 2019, there was a, a pre-election debate that you know, certain persons, of course, you know, attended. Um, Nigerians forgave every single blunder on certain political aspirants and, of course, scrutinized the other ones, you know, with all they had, with all the weaponry that they could bring uh, forth. There were so many blunders on a certain, you know, group of people that couldn't in any way answer certain questions, didn't know whatsoever, left or right, they didn't have any answers to any of the questions. Um, Nigerians forgave those, you know, things and, of course, continued to ensure that those people have a soft landing um, with their political journey. Whereas others don't face the same scrutiny. And that's what really hurts me because we're very likely going to do the same thing in 2023 where you can already tell that there are certain people who have questionable characters who you can already tell don't in any way deserve to even consider political uh, space in Nigeria. But they will not be asked these questions. They would be given soft landing. They would be given, you know, basically a free expressway to run, um, in, you know, and um, you know, contest for those seats. And those who seemingly, you know, have, you know, a better standard, who seemingly, you know, have better quality, who seemingly have a better track record, would be scrutinized back and forth. And it makes you once again, you know, start to agree with those who say that we get the leaders that we deserve in Nigeria. It might be a hurtful truth, but it is what it is. We get the leaders that we deserve. Yes, you might say, oh, you know, I've been such a good, honest Nigerian. Why do I deserve bad leadership? But because we continue in, in our multitude to let these very, very little loopholes exist, let these very, very poor standards, um, you know, exist with regards to getting into political office, we somehow get the leaders that we deserve in Nigeria. Those are two top trending stories this morning. We'll take a short break. Chris Wando joins us next with Off the Press to have a review of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. Good morning once again and welcome to The Breakfast.